Um, so we proceed at once with the, the opening lecture by Professor Francois Berger. Um, Professor Berger told me I just need, just need to uh, say her name by way of an introduction, but I really feel the need to go a bit beyond that, uh, if, uh, especially, especially for those among you that might be less well acquainted with her work, which is, has been an inspiration for many of us uh, over the years. Um, so I just uh, um, uh, provide a few, uh, some information on, on the work of Françoise Hachet. She obtained a doctor degree in political science at the University of Berkeley in California in 1995. She has lived in different places, lectured at different universities. Uh, in 2004, she became a member of the Committee for the Mali Comité pour la mémoire et l'histoire de l'esclavage, Committee for the Remembrance and History of Slavery. She's also a member of several other institutions working to prevent discrimination and racism. Uh, an important part of her work is the cooperation over the years with artists and her production of several exhibitions uh, and documentary films uh, on Marie Condé, for instance, and on Aimé Césaire. Um, um, her latest, I think her latest exhibition uh, as a curator has been, uh, has uh, had a Big resonance uh, in 2013 at the Louvre, L'Esclave au Louvre, Humanité Invisible. Uh, she was from 2014 to 2018 chairholder of the Global Southeast Chair at the Collège Études Mondiale in Paris. And I uh, just uh, list uh, quite a few uh, uh, books, the types, quite a few titles. Uh, in 1999, uh, she published a doctor dissertation with the title Monsters of the Revolutionaries, Colonial Family Romance and Great Sarge. Uh, in 2006, La Mémoire Enchaînée, Question de In 2010, together with other authors such as Pascal Blanchard and Achille Bembe, Fracture Postcolonial. This is a book that has been particularly inspiring for some of us. Um, in 2013, Exposé l'Esclavage, Mythologie et Pratique, et um, and, uh, in 2017, Le Vendre des Femmes. Uh, these are just a few hints uh, at uh, Professor Francois Vergès' uh, multi various work. Uh, I cannot tell how pleased and honored I am that she was at once, that she at once accepted our invitation to deliver the inaugural lecture at this uh, conference. So, um, um, without further ado, uh, Professor, um, the floor is yours. Well, uh, thank you so much, really thank you to the organizing committee to invite me you know, to open the celebration, and I hope I will be up to the challenge. <clears throat> I'm very also sorry, I want to apologize, that I won't be able to stay until the end of the conference. But I must be in Paris on Saturday because we're organizing anti-Trump demonstration. You know that Macron has invited Trump to the November 11 uh, celebration commemoration. And even in the commemoration, besides inviting Trump, uh, there is also really uh, this, this turning, ideological turning point that we see everywhere uh, with the celebration of Pétain, who was also the, the one who crushed. Uh, the revolt in the reef in Morocco, or, uh, or you know, all the, the, the murder of the soldier who did not want to fight during World War One, and was of course the collaborator of the Nazi regime in France. So this, all this, effectively, is a really will, will you know, justify uh, demonstration. So I'm really sorry, but duty call. Okay. So um, before even starting, I would like really to say that you know. Uh, listening to this and the introduction about imagining the future, um, for me, the imagining the future is a really long history, you know, of, of really being there under the worst condition. Um, of and I'm thinking, of course, about colonial slavery, you know, about which I've been constantly working, and the fact that uh, in in the darkest, you know, 
time of colonial slavery, when slavery was as natural as day and night, you know, the church, the state, the culture, the law, everything supported and justified slavery. And slaves always say that there would be an alternative. Always that there would be, you know, the dream of freedom would be there. And they will set up insurrection, revolt, my own community. So for me, this uh, incredible commitment to a struggle, even in the darkest time, is an inspiration today, when again, <coughs> we are told that there is no alternative. So I am titled by my talk, The Price We Pay to Be Humanized, which is a sentence uh, you know, from uh, Fernando Solanas, film 1968, uh, Las Horas de los Hornos, and I hope you have seen the film because it's a fantastic film. Um, which is, I thought, uh, a good introduction to a talk that seeks to pay homage to a woman who has this is a sentence to him, you know, also. Uh, if they, uh, when you say that it is this year, it is the Horas de los Hornos, about those who were said to be outside of humanity and were being for centuries seeking to be humanized, to be organized as human and have paid a high price for that. They are mostly in the thoughts, which is not as well as the success and per se, it's not a geographical, it's not a geography, but rather, and I quote, a metaphor for human suffering caused by capitalism and imperialism on the global level, as well as for the resistance to overcoming or minimizing it. Reverend Torres de Sousa Santos are that we are witnessing the conflation today of two time frames. On the one hand, there is a pressing sense of urgency. On the other, there is a sense that our times calls for deep and profound civilizational changes. And it is true that every morning when I wake up, I feel pulled between these two temporality. And quite often, when I speak to activists, the, their first question is, all what you say is really good and well, but does not give us a course of action. What should we do? What is to be done? I cannot help thinking also, of course, con uh, confronted to that question, that capital has become very fast, you know, has a lot of resources and needs to counter any initiative that seeks to transform the world. Its capacity to absorb and commodify when it does not need to destroy has accelerated. Yet, if we agree that we live within multiple entanglement in the age of acceleration, as I had seen, as called it, we must learn also to resist to this economy of speed and learn to take our time to accept that answer will not come easily. We have to reject the world as pragmatism, being realistic, the hegemony of creativity, or the banality of expression like amazing people working in digital and guerrilla agencies. We have effectively all these which are there to offer to soften the brutality and cruelty of neoliberalism and imperialism. Darker times, you know, seems effectively ahead for the dark nation. The past that Europe is responsible for, race, fabrication of vulnerability to death, as Ruth Wilson Gilmore has described partial capitalism, is still the present for millions of people throughout the world. The past that witnessed the emergence of colonialism and capitalism with enslavement, set on a grand scale, disposable life, cheap nature and cheap labor, sexism and racism, into a time to protect the interests of capital, look like a promised future in the millionaire effort of women and men in the global south to challenge European abyssal thinking, do not win also their millionaire battle for collective, reproductive, and environmental justice for land's right, indigenous rights, and gender rights. This feeling that the past is our present and even our future effectively challenge our understanding of temporality. And perhaps we have to think how to change that you know, idea of temporality. In this talk today, I want to, follow, you know, to, to discuss mostly decolonial feminism as a political reunizing today. And this in a context when a new form of aggressive civilizing feminism has emerged since the 1980s, a feminism that has launched a war against black and Muslim women and men. In Europe, in 1999, the war started. And remember, it was also the year of the fall of the Berlin Wall and the celebration of the centennial of the French Revolution. 
It was the year of the uh, victory of François Furet and his analysis of the French Revolution as terror, advocating human rights as the dominant ideology. For the huge spectacle of the celebration entitled La Marseillaise on the Champs Elysees, to which uh, socialist president François Mitterrand invited all the leaders of the most uh, powerful state in the world, and which preceded the meeting of, of these uh, leaders, the, the, the choreographer invited uh, by the socialist government organized a show of, of what he called planetary tribes on the Champs Elysees and on which we saw half-naked African dancing to drums, Soviet soldiers marching under artificial snow, British under artificial rain, and etc. So it was a spectacle of the you know, like each anesthetization of tribes of the planet of tribe. And then the, just, uh, the, the, the meeting of the leader went on as planned, just after that. So this, you know, uh, the, the celebration of the French Revolution totally to pacify the you know, proceeding, the meeting of the leaders. Meanwhile, a meeting of the seven poorest countries of the world was organized at the Mutualité, demanding the cancellation of the third world debt. 1999 was, I argue, a turning point as well for feminism for white feminism. In October of that same year, white feminist organizations supported by intellectual writers, journalists, and associations organized again at the Mutualité, you know the historical site of meeting for leftist, anti-imperialist, and radical feminist movement in Paris, where the meeting of the seven uh, poorest uh, countries had occurred, the first public meeting in Europe against the bank. Muslim patriarchy was said to be the worst and most brutal patriarchy in the entire world. Muslim women were said to be the hostage of their fathers and brothers, and the letter of their threat to women's rights everywhere. Many of the women who had signed the manifesto were associated with the left. Some had even supported the Algerian struggle for independence. But they united to fight a new enemy, Islam, and to save Muslim women from that patriarchy. It was a turning point, I say, because it brought together the ideology of human rights, women's rights, and race thinking. The new civilizing mission of white feminism was launched, with greater means of propaganda than ever before. Later, in 2001, as you may remember, Laura Bush declared when the US launched its war against Afghanistan that, I quote, the war on Osama bin Laden al Qaeda terrorist network is a fight for the rights and dignity of women and children. And the United States formally declared its support for the inclusion of women in the government of post Taliban Afghanistan. The feminist civilizing mission war had the full support of the conservative presidency, West President. This feminist civilizing mission of the 21st century was revived to counter the intense globalization of women in the global south, where protested feminism, feminicide, rape, or state politics that seek to hold back women's rights, and linking their struggle to land's rights, stopping police violence and massive incarceration. They were met with public court to murder and rape, you know. The murder, for instance, this year of Maria Franco had been a warning as well as have been the rape of young tribal women in India or the assassination of indigenous feminist activists. This movement, this feminist movement, decolonial feminist movement, which has emerged in the global south or among racialized minorities in the north, are neither a new wave nor a new generation of feminists, but a new movement in the long historical process of decolonization. Feminist struggle in the South are not waves landing on a shore to die before another wave arrives. This analogy imposes a temporality that does not acknowledge the temporality of struggle, the day by day work, you know. It does not explain why they are set back or defeat. It does not bring to light the mechanism of pacification, erasure, and repression. By speaking in terms of waves and generation, what is obscured is the temporality of the long road to freedom, to borrow the title of a book by Angela Davis, Earth Borrowing from the Slave Songs of Freedom. Among the tools then, deployed to lead the global revolution at the end of the 1980s, and in which was to live in 30 years later, women's rights have become the West's last best card to defend European modernity. It is a powerful discourse. 
you know, who will be for forced marriages of girls, you know, who can be for forbidding women to work, to walk free in the street, to be free of sexual harassment and violence. You know. Women's liberation has been windowed and scandalized by colonial forces. Think about the English for colonial policy against Sarti, or the French colonial practice of invading Angelian women, or European missionaries in present gender clothing on women everywhere. But neoliberal capitalism, as I say, had managed to both resume and greatly expand this practice. Either, indeed, by the 2000s, feminism was no longer an answer. Nationalist and neoliberal forces could embrace feminism, right wing or conservative party, endorse women leadership. Sarah Palin, Marine Le Pen, Teresa May, Angela Morgan, or Georgia Meloni, you know, are only some examples of this. We show all the limit of a formalistic approach to gender equality and the representation of women in elected institutions. The most, you know, one of these expressions of this new feminism is what Sarah Faris has called female nationalism. That is, she explained, the mobilization of ideas of gender and sexual equality stemming from <laughs> feminist liberation struggle to justify military aggression and racist measures. Indeed, in white feminism, the category of women remains a tightly ordered one. Political decolonial feminism does challenge this counter offensive. It is based on a critique of women's rights as they have been articulated in recent decades to serve feminine imperialist politics and capital. Rather than being exclusively intersectional, political decolonial feminism looks at the totality of structure, ideology, laws, practice that produce what are called women. It questions the youthfulness even of the notion of gender, as we observe many forms of identifying oneself than within the two gender, and goes beyond the idea that only two sexualities exist. It refuses the notion of parity that maintains inequality. Or as the ecological feminist Ines Rankin has put it, who wants an equal piece of the pie when the pie is toxic? So, um, gender has effectively reached its limit, first by implying that women constitute a group and women have never constituted by itself a political group. It has been criticized on the notion of gender, as we know, for a long time, and Maria Lugonas has even spoken of the coloniality of gender, the heterosexism of the colonial gender system, the fact that colonialism imposed European gender arrangement on the colonized. It is known that the most important you know, device sometimes in many African and Asian society was not women and men, but free and unfree people. Indeed, you know, solidarity and uh, among uh, women is nothing natural, and the anti-feminist movement has had a strong female constituency and sometimes leadership, and it is successfully mobilizing in online and offline spaces. Neoliberal identity politics have weakened political opposition to rational capitalism, and this is why we should disentangle identity from the gender equality agenda. Already because it ignores the important mobilization of role, also that some men assume as partner to women in challenging patriarchal orders. I'm thinking, for instance, here in Egypt, when the most successful group in popularizing the notion that women have the right not to be sexually harassed, independently of what they are wearing or where they have been, have been the youth-led initiative comprised of women and men in, 2000, in 2011. With graffiti, song, slogan, online activism, and awareness raising a fort on the street of Carol, men's involvement in anti-sexual harassment activism helped bring it out of the gender ghetto. The gender binary referred to the cultural, economic, and legal practices that reinforce the idea that only two genders exist. It obscures even how sex assignment at birth, inequal distribution of power and resources and responsibility based on this sex assignment, compulsory heterosexuality, and the policing of violation to gender and heterosexual norms reinforce gender binary approaches. I would like to, after this introduction, you know, of in, in, brief, in which I argue that the gender binary is in fact a precondition necessary for patriarchy. So if we want, in fact, to destroy patriarchy, we must deconstruct that division, that gender division. Now I would like to turn you know, uh, to uh, some concrete examples where I try to clarify what political decolonial feminists can answer to 
or you know, analyze. And this will concern the process of primitive accumulation of social reproduction. And uh, so the first, my first point, I mean, the first example I want to give, is about the, the caring and cleaning jobs and, uh, you know, and the industry of cleaning and caring today. <coughs> Last January, in France, January of this year, 100 women among them, Chris, Catherine Deneuve, signed a public letter blaming the Me Too anti-harassment movement for creating, I quote, a totalitarian climate that unfairly punished men for flirting and insistently or clumsy infantilized women and undermined sexual freedom. They wrote that men have been sanctioned in their work, pushed to resign, where their only wrongdoing was to touch a knee, try to steal a kiss, speak about intimate thing during professional dinner, or send messages that are sexually loaded to a woman who has not attracted to them. They concluded that far from being a woman empower themselves, the Me Too movement actually served the interests of the enemies of sexual freedom, the religious extremists, the reactionaries, and those who believe that women are a species apart. The letter led to a controversy, I mean, an international controversy, it was everywhere in a lot of newspapers of the West, you know, with claim and counter claims about suffering, victimization, human sexuality. It was also was about you know about who is the best white man you know if this is a French man who is you know open the door and flirt you know clumsy but nicely or the American one man who will not effectively touch a woman so it was like a competition between who is the best white man you know so I'm not interested of course in that controversy or rather I would like to reflect on what it masks at the same time at the same moment you know what it marginalized. Indeed, as international media were agitating around the men's right to flirt, more than an hundred you know, women of color were winning their fight against a cleaning company working for the SNCF, the state-owned railway company, after 45 days of strike in Paris. There were women from you know, Africa, North and South Sahara, from Asia, India and Sri Lanka, mothers in their 40s and 50s living in what is called the banlieue. The women were fighting for better salaries, better working conditions, and against sexual harassment of the men who was if it is asking for sexual favors in return for some you know, better working condition. This very important struggle and consequent victory was barely acknowledged in the mainstream media and by what feminism. I put these two events together to show effectively what has been constructed as what is important in feminist struggle. And indeed, when a, a newspaper asked me at the time to write about, you know, the, the controversy, the retro, I said, no, I don't, I, I'm, I'm, I'm not interested in that. But if you, if you want, I can write about the strike of women. They refuse, whatever. So it made me think about the centrality of cleaning and, you know, and cleaning and caring in capitalism. Cleaning women were globally considered as women work without which capitalism and patriarchy would not be able to function. Just think of the million of square meters of office, you know, the first client of the cleaning industry, where bankers, insurers, employees of digital and media industry come to feed capital every day. We are not clean. You know, if late at night or very early in the morning, thousands of women were not entering this office, and also hospitals, schools, libraries, you know, railway stations, to clean the toilets, the meeting room, Entering the museum, the hospital, the school, the university, the commercial mall. Of course, men also do cleaning work. I say that because quite constantly people are telling me, but what about the men who clean? Right. So, of course, men are also doing uh, cleaning work, but in fact, you know, the number are much less. And even, you know, uh, those who are doing that are usually at the bottom of the racial class divide, you know, whether that is in India, low class in Africa, South, East, South Asian men in the Gulf state. And even the men who pick up the garbage in the urban city have testified that their work is considered as women's work. The cleaning industry, which is globally a growing industry, as I say, employs in fact more men, more women than men. One out of two, uh, one out of four migrant women is a domestic worker. They open the city everywhere, every day, everywhere. They do a work that is indispensable, but when women hidden. That, is, uh, that must also women underqualified and underpaid. The cleaning industry is an industry where sexual and, and uh, sexual harassment and violence is excessive. Even you know, some months ago, we learned that in Sri Lanka, 
agency that recruit uh, female domestic workers for the girls' sake, were forcing them to take contraceptive so that if they were raped by their bosses, there would be no proof of that rape. More than 60 million domestic workers around the world provide essential services that enable other to work or the women to work outside their home. Domestic workers help keep labor market and economies working around the globe. In France, 60% of the cleaning workers are women, 70%, 6% are foreign born. In Italy, one out, two, one out of two care workers is a migrant woman, and 700,000 migrant workers are in the care industry. In Germany, one out of four care workers is a migrant woman. And in 2008, 200,000 female migrants provided care for the elderly in Germany. The vast majority of care workers is foreign born and female everywhere. Europe, in fact, counts 10% of migrants of pay job in the care industry. To hang with this number, you know, we can say that 50% of migrant women are usually in the cleaning care industry in Europe. Only 5% of native born women are from in the same sector. So this um, this is for me absolutely uh, uh, central to, to what effectively could be the tema of uh, uh, political feminist struggle today. Uh, we, as we do know, you know, as I say, you know, that this is a racialized and gender industry deeply. And of course, it all back to the story of slavery when black women were taking care of children and, you know, white women. And it, whether in the past, a uh, woman of color allowed white men a life of leisure. Today, it allows uh, women to have a professional life in post World War II Europe. Cleaning is about caring, and caring is about cleaning, about making the world hospitable for work, circulation, resting, eating, and loving. Cleaning and caring is about primitive accumulation, about the organization of Russian capitalism, about its, the racialization and necessary invisibility of that work. In Europe, very quickly, I mean, I will say because it, it goes back also to what Sarah Faris called female nationalism, cleaning, caring, cleaning and caring became industrialized in the 19th century when the first company opened and selected poor women from the countryside for working in the bourgeois family. And if you know little French literature of the 19th century, it's full of domestic work, women seduced by their, you know, bosses, their masters, and so on. Luck, it was John Sweden. They were replaced in the 1960s partly by women coming from the periphery of Western Europe, that is from Spain and Portugal, and also by black young women from the French Antilles or from Réunion. Indeed, in France, thousands of women were brought from former slave colony to clean and care for bourgeois home. Feminism started then, not really in the 2000s as a Paris has asserted, you know, young black women were brought to France, you know, as to say that they will find them freedom there and will flee it also uh, uh, backward masculinity. <coughs> it is important to reappropriate, as black domestic workers did in the 1940s, cleaning areas as a central tema, as I say, for political and colonial feminist struggle. Domestic workers have been organizing everywhere, protesting against lack of rights and asking for new laws. I would like to go further. Can we make the struggle for you know, cleaning and caring workers, not just asking for more protective law, but a political struggle for social justice, uh, for anti-capitalist and anti-racist struggle? In March of this year, of 2000, in Chennai, a show on labor curated by a young woman brought together 33 artists, Dalit artists, who did their work I mean, who, who, about their own parents who have been workers. Who were, you know, really poor workers. One of the work was depicting women in their 40s, 50s who are cleaning the railway station in Chennai. Near that, the picture that you know about this woman, there were three sheets of paper had it written by a young man, the son of the support worker, and which say, I quote, Cleaning faces is not an ordinary thing. With bare hand, my grandfather cleans human faces to such an extent that it's soaked in the line of his hand. Soaked like blood into blood. And he concluded that woman, who was depicted, should stop cleaning. Everyone should clean their own faces themselves. We all should join with the woman and clean human faces. Doing it that way, that woman can be one of us as equal, not only by saying it by words of mouth, but by feeling it. Effectively, who clean the world? Who is performing this indefensible work? 
and in which condition. Capitalism is not only the production of human as waste, it is also the production of waste, of a vast amount of waste which need to be cleaned. According to a 2016 World Bank study, the World Island garbage production amounts to 1.3 billion tonnes of waste, or around 11 million tonnes of garbage every day. 99% of what is purchased is thrown away within six months. By 2015, the total daily garbage will likely triple, and by 2001, the total annual waste will exceed 4 billion tonnes. Since 1950, the world the capitalist world, has generated 9 billion tons of plastic waste, only 9% of which get recycled. What must be kept in mind is that it is not for the constant cleaning by people of color around the world, whether of bourgeois or of industrial waste, waste, you know, like in Bangladesh or the world, you know. There will be, we will not have the world we live in. On average, you know, this is for me absolutely important that we do live in a world where cleaning and caring has been made totally invisible. And so it is fighting, you know, again the way in which social reproduction has been enslaved and rationalized that it would be to fight again that industry. My, the second example, you know, of, of the terrain for uh, political, decolonial political feminism, feminist struggle, sorry, is a question of uh, uh, social reproduction. Anyways, last year I wrote a book on forced abortion and sterilization in Reno Island in the mid uh, 1960s, 1970s. Seven uh, to eight thousand poor women of color were aborted every year, you know, uh, without consent by white men, doctor coming from France. Remember that abortion was a crime in France at the time, right? So there was a trial, nonetheless, because there was a scandal. And at the end of February 1971, and nobody was punished. Not one of the doctors was punished. They went, they, they walked free. What interested me, I mean, was why they felt entitled to abort. Not just why when they were not punished, but why they felt entitled to abort this woman. And second, my second question was also, why in April 5th, 1971, so two, two months after the the, the end of the trial, which was publicized in the French national media, so the feminists knew it, the white feminists knew it. It was in the newspaper in which they were publishing their own manifesto, you know, Le Monde, where I'm sorry. So there was a manifesto of 243 women, uh, French women, who publicly declared they had aborted, you know, so they, you know, breaking the law. There was not a word about forced abortion, and their struggle, therefore, for abortion, became a universal struggle regardless of the racial political abortion that had been you know, occurring in all the colonies as well, of course. But my question was also why, you know, like not just uh, stopping at the fact that these are white men, you know, feeling you know, that they have the power to do that. What happened? What, what made it also possible? You know, not just, you know, the pure, just the racism and white men, but what was the contact, you know, atmosphere? So I, I pulled a thread, you know, and I, I saw that in 19, uh, just after World War II, you had two uh, series of reconfiguration. In the French Republic then itself, you know, it was like, how do, you, do we do, you know, with the French colonial empire in the context of the Cold War, U.S. hegemony and decolonization, right? What do we do with that? How do we, we no longer need the workforce that it was before, the, we no longer need the colonial workforce, so what do we do? So we're going to claim, and then we're not going to develop this country. So what are we going to claim? We're going to claim that women are making too many children, and they are, you know, the cause of poverty and underdevelopment, right? So that would be the first reason. But then also on the global level, the U.S. led the struggle for birth control. You know, so absolutely very heavy birth control in what was called the Third World Bank. By already by 19, 1947, in the World Congress on Demography, U.S. representatives were also saying that third world women, because of the birth rate, were responsible for poverty and underdevelopment. And they, by the 1950s, early 1950s, they were connecting that high birth rate cause of poverty and development, where then it would provoke, it would produce migration to the north. Because all these children will be born, finding no job, being poor, so what will they do? They will migrate. And the, the third connection which was made by the mid 1950 was with the environment. All these people will destroy the environment. So the connection between high birth rate by you know, women of color, 
uh, migration that cannot be controlled and that should be controlled, and environmental destruction. We are connected already by the 1950s. And in fact, by in the first meeting about environment by the UN, these three points were connected. And at the World uh, Congress of Demography of Population, you had people from the World Bank, the IMF, where they are, and the, all the also organization on the control of migration and environment. So that nexus was already constructed by the mid-1950s, which, um, about which we see the full you know, policies today being developed. But then, I say why, of course, I understood that it was a new configuration of capitalism that did not need, you know, again, you know, that the control of migration were needed, who must be coming to the West now, you know, to clean the place or to work in the factories. But now, you know, and uh, so how this, all this nexus, you know, on this in uncontrolled migration, birth rate, control of birth rate, threat on security and environment, add and form structural adjustment program, and also the demand for the decline of our services and prenatal and postnatal care in the third world. But I went further back, I said to myself, okay, okay so why, why suddenly are too many children in the, in the South, you know? What happened during, you know, how uh, the birth of the enslaved population was being, uh, you know, managed by the, by, by the different state? And even slave trade, you know, because there have been studies on the reproduction in the plantation, in the colony, but very, practically nobody talked about the fact that a million of African deported were born in Africa, so at the border. So how African born was made into capital to be effectively to feed the incredible deportation. So the black woman's home was capital, invisible but indispensable for you know, centuries of you know, kidnapping African and deporting them to the colony. In the colony themselves, you had two policies. In the US, it was a slave breeding industry, as some historians have said, that effectively, as after 1808, when the slave trade with Africa was abolished in the United States, the reproduction became local and the slave trade was internal, you know, within the state. In the, you, know, you see that, for instance, in 20 years of slave, for instance. And some of the states, like Virginia and other states, became the leading state for the reproduction so, of, of, of slave. So women, uh, uh, enslaved women, who were giving birth, were raped six to eight weeks after giving birth to be, you know, pregnant again and to produce children who were sold or, you know, granted. So that was a solution in the US. In the British and French colony, it was the solution was not local reproduction, very little local reproduction, it was by importation. Importing, constantly importing slaves. So you had two forms of politics of you know managing social reproduction in that. So it was really a, and in fact in the post-slavery movement, the women of color still provided bodies for imperialism and capitalism. As you do, as you may remember, between 1830 and 1930, uh, more than 30 million Indians were, you know, thrown around the world to, in the colony to work in the mine or in the plantation, and the same for Chinese people and also still African and Irish people that you know, sent around. And so it was still, uh, and, uh, and in fact, either during slave trade or during post-slavery migrant uh, circulation of indentured work. Uh, the ratio was always two thirds of men for one third of women. So the migration was really gendered. The, what, what capitalism needed then, our plantation, was male workforce, mostly. So that, uh, but after uh, World War II, when the global configuration of capitalism changed, the demand became for a female workforce also, because of the development of the caring and cleaning industry because of the need, effectively, in the bourgeois home to take care of the children and the elderly. So, so this was a reproductive justice when it was effectively by you know, black women and women of color was an anti-racist and an anti-capitalist struggle. It was not just about you know, the right to birth control. So the, the, and it was effectively because it was also to fight against uh, the, 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 the law, the politics, that of structural adjustment program, you know, when, uh, when uh, spending in X was reduced. And 
So that was, uh, that, that is for me also the second, you know, like, tema of, of, of struggle, like for all protective justice, but with this long history uh, that we have behind us. And the third point I would like to, to raise before ending, it, it's also how do, how could we think about politi uh, decolonial political feminism of protection? How do we protect? I mean, what is to protect? In a moment when you have an increased number of protective laws in, in the West, um, and increasing violence and brutality, and both are not absolutely in contradiction, they, are to, they go together. It's, you know, how do you make the city safe for white women? How do you effectively they can walk and so on? How do you gentrify it? How is this making safe? You know, support the politics of gentrification and the politics of whitening the city. So then, effectively, the women who clean have to live really far outside and they cannot live really there, right? And all the women who can tell you of long hours of transport, whether they are from Maputo, Paris, or, or you know, Delhi, or, or Mexico. And they, so the economy also, this is an economy of, of exhaustion of the body, you know, of using the body. This woman tell you they sleep just four hours per night quite often, and they have to wait. So there is a really something going on that brings together also, the, of course, racialization, gender, this economy of exhausting the body, and also the chemical industry, because more and more, of course, chemical products are being used and leading to a lot of disease for this woman, which are not recognized then by the state. But this, for me, really uh, is a very important and connect, in fact, this three point I, I tried to you know, explore this morning, for me, are connected. So I was talking about this protective law and the increased violence and brutality, which is connected also with this civilizing feminism, with this new civilizing mission of feminism that we saw much, you know, also when Alice Schrazer, the historical German feminist, protested against the migrant men of Cologne, you know, during the New Year, where supposedly a black woman and so on. And in fact, that how to make the city safe and who is, you know, basically a threatening body, even um, a black or Muslim body, Arab body. This is the male body. So how all this is being you know, connected is for me uh, very important. So how do you we think effectively of a politic of uh, protection of, against carceral and primitive feminism? In France right now, for instance, a law against sexual harassment in the street has passed, which is to deal with. But the point is, of course, it targets young black men and young Arab men. You know, it really targets. So it's really with the name of, you know, protecting the freedom of women, in the name of women's right, is effectively support Russian, you know, politics. But this is not just in Europe, this is also. So, for me, you know, effectively, there have been particular answers, like Black Lives Matter, you know, a 10-point program about this, you know, like the, the, the question of protection and how to fight against cancer and feminism, of, you know, um, uh, Women who have been like, leaking also the struggle against gentrification and widening of the city with the struggle also for land rights. So, not effectively entering the, the trap of gender struggle. Constantly connecting the fight, for a feminist fight, with you know, this larger context. Constantly. What this caring cleaning tell us about you know, the global organization of migration, the global organization of the industry, the global organization of cleaning, the global organization of the workforce, with the chemical industry, with the widening of the city, with the protective law, with the fact that women can talk about let's get, you know, like let's be less men flirt with our you know with ourselves because they have the you know the possibility of saying that because women of color are cleaning their house and making the world safe for them. And clean and clean color. So, this is redefining protection and redefining, therefore, also because protection is about also caring. You care more the fair, as you care for children or for the elderly, it's also about you know, how do you protect. So, this, is, uh, this was, you know, um, how do we reinvent in terms of that, as feminist philosopher Lisa Dolan has suggested, you know, how do we reinvent a political self defense today? Not trying to appeal to the moral sense of the aggressor, you know, but effectively to develop self-defense, which has been developing everywhere and which has a long effective history. How do we effectively organize a decolonial feminist politics of self-defense and protection that effectively take us out of this different injunction of protection by the state, 
or protection by the police, by the army, by the tribunal, which are in fact institutions which were conduct of racism, patriarchal, and capitalism. Thank you.